Hello and welcome everyone to another special episode of Halo Clans. Today is a new voice, I know. Uh, my name is Master X Makarov, Makarov for short. I'm a new voice, kind of been a, a producer on this channel for quite some time. And with me is our very special guest, if you can't re already read, Shadow Sniper 172 veteran of the community, uh, former leader of the United Nations, current leader of the Commonwealth, and genius, possible revolutionary of this brand new combat idea. Shadow Sniper, why don't you take it from here? Well, thank you. You seem to flatter me. Um, I don't, I'm not sure how successful things are going to go, but um, I can show you along if you'd like. I'd, I'd love to. Let's go ahead. Okay. All right. Please follow me. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, uh, we dubbed this the area system. Uh, area system, as in it includes more than one map. Uh, it's a type of combat, a uh, type of map that requires a type of combat. Uh, ahead of us, you see a dam, or what appears to be a dam. Um, I'm going to explain this map systematically as I go. Um, I'm going to pause and explain different areas, uh, the purposes, and the overall uh, spiel of the map and the system, how it works. So, as a combat system, um, our, our maps, what we call area maps, essentially are the borders of our clan. Uh, these maps contain destructible objectives. That's right, destructible objectives. Um, that can be approached and destroyed by anyone, including the enemy, or especially the enemy. <laughs> However, they can also be sabotaged by spies, um, so that becomes a serious threat if you're in a game. So, uh, allow me to show you. All right. Follow me. There are two ways up to this dam, and there are two destructible objectives. First one is off to our left. Uh, each destructible objective has a keypad in which you must plant the bomb. As you can see, the bomb is now planted. All right. Please back up. Mm -hmm. When you destruct the bomb, oh nice. The objective is considered destroyed, so it's now on fire. So that would be how you very good indication you consider the objective destroyed. Um, each objective will be defended in almost a progressive style. So. This area, this dam, will be defended by the defending team first. Um, the flank will be guarded by usually a manis or a part of the team um, in order to ensure the enemy doesn't try to cheat the game and go to the next objective. Um, so I'll just go ahead and destroy this objective as well. In fact, we'll be destroying all the objectives today. Yeah, for carnage. Up. Yes. So, supposing the enemy destroys the oh. first objective, or first two objectives, uh, the defending team will recover and retreat to the next defendable objective. So, just follow uh, me. And they'll do that under that. the cover of the menace. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, so, I am assuming this is again an honor code. Will the attacking team be allowed to keep attacking the defending team? Is it up to them to make it here? Or... Uh, is it just a free-for-all at that point to get to the next objective? Because you know there's going to be there, people there who may no, attack out of line. Right. There are no there are no rules stating that the attackers must uh, must wait for the defenders to recover. All right. Uh, in fact, that's why, at least for the Commonwealth, uh, we organize our battles a certain way. So um, let me explain that as I go. Okay. Uh, you see this gate up here? Uh, yep. This gate is open at the start of the game, with a switch only on the opposite side, and the map continues that way towards the outpost and other defenses. We close this gate, leave one person on the other side. Now, once that gate's shut, the only way to open it is to destroy an objective, the second objective. So, mm -hmm. there's no way for the enemy to continue on throughout the map without accomplishing the objective. The map forces you to accomplish it. Now you're wondering how the defending team will recover from losing the first objective and defend the second objective, which is the port on my right. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have a Manus stationed here, as well as a few extra soldiers, um, spare soldiers, to defend this area, while the other half of the team is defending the first objective. If they die, when they die, they will, under the cover of the Manus, proceed to their next defendable position in the port. Uh, so that's the job of the Manus. That's why the Manus is on the map. All so right. it's basically doing the job of four guys, and it's covering their retreat long enough for them to get to this objective. Uh, if the enemy tries to take out the Manus first, 
would be very difficult as they would have to cross the lines of fire of the team defending the dam as well as face the team defending this area. So it basically, basically they need to take the dam first. They're forced to take the dam first. Because once they do that, we have no reason to defend that area. We will retreat to the port. So follow me past the security gate and through the parking lot. We develop <laughs> and build these maps uh, much like campaign missions. So if you get that feel, it's like a campaign mission that we were going for that. So okay. this is the warehouse. Um, once you come through here, I mean, imagine there'll be defenders here. You reach the docks, and the docks um, have various crates and such. There's also a warthog over here for the enemy or anyone who takes control of this area. There are invisible blockers above, which prevent the enemy or anyone from uh, cheating the game, per se. You must fight through the areas we want you to fight through to mix up the combat. All right. Through here, this is a maze of containers. And uh, this mixes up the combat. This makes it close quarters, so if the defenders are in here, the enemy can push their way through here and fight fight close quarters. Okay. That's awesome, actually. Well, once <laughs> through this maze of containers, you reach the base of the crane, which, uh, for realism, it's on a rail, but that's just aesthetics. Right. Um, up the stairs, you have the oil reserves for the port itself, which can be destroyed. Can you please back up? Yep. Okay. And then through here, you have this big red button that says to our members, do not push. <laughs> um, enemy members, only attackers should press this button. This is the gate override. It permanently unlocks the gate, allowing enemies uh, permanent access to the next area of the map. So let's say the enemy fights through all this area. They would press this button and now open that gate, allowing them to advance further through the map. At this point, the Manus is either destroyed and then a new one has come in to play or has retreated behind the gate and is now defending until the... Okay, I got lost in my own maze. <laughs> All right, come this way. I suppose it's not hard to get lost in a maze regardless of who made it, but that's just me speaking. Well, yeah, the idea was it was um, just a place for the battle to be kind of mixed up a little bit instead of it, it being the it, same. Right, and it's a good idea, honestly. Mix it up from mid to long to short. Make it so not even the defender sometimes knows what they're doing in certain situations. Yes. Uh, well, follow me, and you come through the gate, and you reach the swamp. Yes, the swamp. So we even mixed up the combat more. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of all of our maps, all of our area maps, are designed in a similar layout. Obviously, it's a different theme for each map, but this map is a swamp and a coastal swamp type feel. Right. Now, in the swamp, you have spread out these fuel cells, um, which are also destructible. There are four of them. And uh, there's one over there, there's one over there, and there's one over yonder. Um, but please follow me. We'll just pretend they got destroyed, so scratch what I said at the beginning of the video. <laughs> <laughs> Too much work. <laughs> Too much work, yes. Well, in our clan, uh, each area has an outpost at the end of it, and each area is assigned to each company. So when you see A03, that's Alpha03. So this area is assigned to Alpha Company. Each company in our clan is assigned several areas to protect, uh, to simulate borders or companies protecting areas of the border. If you come up here, the gate starts in the down position. The oh. entire base... Uh, different areas. They're scalable uh, by buddy jumping, so even with the gate shut, the enemy can still come in. You have three warthogs for the defenders, uh, one manis. If you climb this ladder, it's a clamber ladder, so it's just uh, hey. one jump and then another jump. Yeah, as long as you don't hit the brace like I did. <laughs> yeah, we've got some towers here. Sorted defenses. And like I said, each area map is standardized, so each base will have the same weapons, the same equipment, uh, same layout. And speaking Here's of that, like... So please follow me. Oh. Oh. I was about to ask, what kind of weapons uh, will you be arming your defenders with, uh, exactly? Well, look no further than the weapons <laughs> on the wall behind me. I was going to ask, and I saw the rack of assault rifles, and I was like, oh, well, never mind. <laughs> this is the armory. These are the weapons that the defending team will employ. Notice there's only one DMR. 
um, there's only one battle rifle. Uh, yes, there are magnums and some SMGs, but there's nothing too overpowered or long-reaching. Uh, our primary weapon, at least for the Commonwealth, is the assault rifle, and uh, we expect the enemies to spawn with ARs as well, and we want to keep the combat primarily to those weapons, uh, as those are the weapons we train with and work hard to succeed with. Um, if you come upstairs, well, actually, I'll show you the uh, generator first. This is the last objective All that right. can be destroyed. It is the outpost generator. So if I press the button and destroy the um, fusion coil, it'll blow up, just like the other objectives. Uh, I won't do that, however, because it's against, it's against the rules. You can't do that. <laughs> uh, please follow me. You never know when someone will join the game and try to raid you. That is very you gotta true. You've got to have at least one, one objective alive, intact. Well, we right, still so have the entire swamp. Please follow swamp. me up to the command center. Ah, oh, that's right. That's right. All right, well. I, I'm not, I'm not questioning you. It. Yeah, I'm not questioning you. I'm just okay. saying. <laughs> All right. Behind oh you are the only other power weapons on the map. Four shotguns, primarily for military police. They're not truly effective at medium to long range, as you know. Right. So they're not really that powerful on this map. And we have one saw for our um, automatic riflemen in one of our teams. So that is it. There's no sniper rifles, no rocket launchers, no nothing like that. So the defending team does have a few weapons, um, higher tier than the enemy, but there, there are not many of them. There's usually only one for certain power weapons, such as the DMR, the battle rifle, and the saw. Um, and our teams only really carry, uh, we only usually carry one or two shotguns per team. Um, but they're here usually, because this is a multi-purpose map, so this right. is also a training map as well. We do training exercises here, that's why. They're here, but there's nothing to overpower that the enemy can acquire. Uh, what we learned in, in Halo Reach very quickly is that uh, <laughs> any weapons you use on the base or have on the base that you don't plan on using in your defense, if the enemy takes the base, they will use them against you. So <laughs> we plan for that. Um, all the weapons here are weapons we are okay with the enemy having as well. Um, this is the gate control, so the gate can be raised and lowered. Uh -huh. And over here, you have something special that I'm sure a few clans have also implemented on the map, uh, on their maps, at least on Halo 5. Uh, it's protected by a failsafe. Uh, this switch destroys the armory if you're the last man in the base. So I'm going to lower that. And boom. Now oh no one can have the DMRs. No. Or the one DMR. The DMR is a game changer. It really can be. I'm, I'm oh, for sure. Just putting it out there. So. For sure. I mean, that's why we only have one, and the battle rifle too, but it's 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 just all... Any ranged weapon over overused. the magnum can definitely yeah. be a game changer. So, right, please follow me. Outside. Okay, if this door chooses to work. <laughs> okay. So, that's the map. Alright. Now, do you have any questions for me regarding the system overall? Um... Okay, I guess the biggest, uh, not the biggest question, one of the first questions is, uh, I assume this is mostly primarily for your clan, but as you spoke, uh, combat with other clans uh, and you being prepared for it, would you try to convince other clans to switch over to this from uh, the raid base system? Or is it just going to be one of those clans will kind of trickle in if they so choose and it's not really your concern whether or not they do well the way I see it um, our first concern is to take care of our clan and our clan members so ensuring they have a military based clan experience and um, that means we come first so we will use this system regardless of what the community thinks um, any clan that wishes to fight the Commonwealth will fight us on our terms, our maps, our, our way of style of play. Whether or not the community comes on board with this type of, this type of uh, system is up to them. However, I will highly encourage it. Um, the area system, as it is, the way it is, is, um, is a different style of raid. There's a definite winner and a definite loser. It, isn't, it doesn't have extensive or complicated rules of engagement. The maps themselves naturally limit unenjoyable factors in raids. For example, uh, there are a few different areas to spawn in in the spawn area, so you're not going to get spawn killed as much. Um, it will happen, I'm sure, but it will be very limited. 
the defending team isn't extremely overpowered. We have a few power weapons, but it's not. It's just not in 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 an overload. So it's not necessarily fair. It's not designed to be fair, but it it maintains an enjoyable aspect to it. So it is more realistic. No no military team all has rocket launchers or Spartan lasers or sniper rifles in real <laughs> life. Um, so you see soldiers walking around with their their rifles and a few a few maybe they have one sniper in their platoon and maybe a few rockets and grenades grenade launchers but that's about it so we're trying to stick to that sort of play and in order to maintain that we will stick to this system but like i said we don't expect the community to follow along right um another question i actually kind of just thought about i don't think we we covered and i presume i know the answer but i would like to get it out of the way is would this be a team-based event or a uh, free-for-all setting? Um, I'm pretty sure we're using the game type right now, but as far as I know, you might still be working out some bugs and flaws and whatnot. Uh, do you see the free-for-all setting we're in right now being the final build, or do you plan on working on that a little bit? Well, to maintain the traditional aspect of a raid and a battle, a clan battle, as well as maintain our you know individual colors, uh, we will keep it as a free-for-all game type. Uh, the reasons for this is because this is how we've always done it. Um, it's, in my opinion, uh, the best way to do the first set of raids. However, the area system doesn't just include uh, our border maps. That's what these are. This right. is the basic raid map. This is going to be the most played um, type of map in our clan for raids, um, are the border maps. However, in a war, if an enemy were to take one of these maps, as in if they were to successfully destroy all the objectives, um, then we would offer them the option of advancing further into our territory onto what we would call an operation map. These operation maps are team-based, and they are scenario maps, basically battle maps, uh, where the defending team um, is in has increased defenses and the attacking team has increased weaponry and vehicles to attack with. So it's a scaled-up battle. So not all of our battles will be fought like this. After that, um, if the enemy uh, proceeds and wins two operation maps in a row, we will give them the option of advancing towards one of our cities, uh, and you will be—they will be fighting on a city sector, which is a very difficult map to take. Uh, should the enemy succeed there, they will have to fight through another two operation maps, and so on, before they hit another city, and so on. So, basically, you're invading our country in the role-play realm All of right. things. Um, so, with it's not that... solely restricted to free-for-all. All Sorry, right. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I, I should have let you finish. That's my bad. But with that being said, um, would this chain continue going, or is there an end to where you can finally say you've won the war? Because uh, you mentioned how they had to go through two more operation-style maps to get to a city and so on and so forth, as if they're invading your country. Uh, how many cities would a clan have, per se? You know, like... Where can you just mark the line and say, okay, no more? Does it continue going till one side gives up, or is there a, a finite answer to this? Well, the idea behind this isn't exactly to end wars. It's to make wars more enjoyable. Uh, so the system isn't designed for you to win necessarily. However, there is a desired end. Uh, eventually, if the enemy continues to win, they will reach the capital um, and if they take the capital, we would at that point <laughs> consider it a loss. <laughs> because uh, if we're losing that badly to one <laughs> clan, then it's just, it's over at that point. So it's like, we're gonna we're just not going to fight you anymore. Just, okay, we're done. GG. <laughs> and what I mean by, what I mean by the idea of um, it, it's not meant to end the wars is um, it is highly unlikely for an enemy to continue winning these battles in a row. So what I'm saying is, if the enemy loses a battle in our territory, we are going to push them back on on our territory and into their territory. So the aim is for other clans, hopefully, um, to catch on and build their own maps like this. So the Commonwealth won't always be on the defensive. So the Commonwealth can counterattack. So clans can counterattack. 
and go into other clans' territory in the <laughs> same manner. And if clans do this, then um, honestly, I'd say that'd be a lot. It'd be a lot more fun and interesting to fight wars. Um, I mean, I can see clans, you know, abusing it and making it different. Like, I can understand some clans will break the rule. And I'd, I'm not sure if I mentioned, there is only one rule. There's no extensive ROE to the area system, at least for the border maps. There is one rule, and that is, if by the end of the time limit, the attacking team has destroyed all destructible objectives, which must be pre-announced to the enemy team or made very obvious on the map. If all of the objectives are destroyed by the end of the time limit, whether it be an agreed time limit or if it was just a surprise raid, no agreed time limit, all the way to the end of six hours or whatever, then the defending team will end the game and accept it as a loss. And that is where the honor code comes in. Not everyone will do that. The Commonwealth will do that, but not everyone will do that. Some people will refuse to accept defeat or claim they've hidden an objective somewhere um, and not in the game and it'll just become a normal raid where just chaos, people killing each other everywhere. <laughs> um, some people will, like I said, they will abuse this and they'll add a lot of power weapons to the map. Uh, they'll make objectives impossible to reach or you know unattainable or almost impossible to destroy. Um, they'll have hidden things on the map that no one else knows about and it'll just be ridiculous the way the commonwealth is doing it is the way it's supposed to be we are setting the example for how this system is designed to function and it's designed to function with what some people would call bare bones so less weapons less vehicles more focus on communication and teamwork uh, the idea behind the progression system is it's meant to slow down the combat Halo 5 is a fast-paced game. Military-style play is, is slower. The way we train our troops for hours on end uh, to communicate and play is for what's supposed to be a more tactical and team-based communication-type game where you can't just go on and do your own individual thing and your team will win. No, your team has to work together. That's what this forces everybody in the game to do, not just the defenders, not also, also the attackers. So it forces <laughs> everyone playing the game, if they're following the one rule, to work together and play the way, in our opinion, military-style play should occur. So that's what I have to say on that. All right. Uh, and with that being said, it is true that um, you know this isn't obviously the first time this has been heard about. There are a few clans who have... Uh, they might have got not... Ha ah, if I can say this properly uh there are clans who don't know about this as extensively as they probably will after watching this video uh but there are clans who have at least heard a vague idea of about this um and it seems to be catching on in some places some people actually like ch uh, the idea of changing up the standard rate a little bit maybe watching this video will just put that final nail in the coffin for their ideas and they'll just do it um, however, I'm sure some of these clans are not even on Halo 5. They might be on Halo 4 or Halo Reach still, where scripting is basically non-existent. There are mods, but scripting as a whole is rather absent from these games. Uh, would you have a suggestion for them if they would like to kind of go on to this idea, even though they don't have the technology to do the game itself? Well, quite honestly, the system, I believe, is most successful and is designed for Halo 5. However, uh, I understand there are some clans that still operate on Halo Reach and Halo 4. Um, I was one of them not too long ago, and um, the system of raids there is pretty standardized. It's been going for years. Uh, everyone just does their own thing, has their own rules. Um, if you would like to go for a more objective-based raid, I guess you can set up objects that are destructible and the enemy knows where they are um, and if they're all destroyed it's the same idea you can end the game if you lose or keep fighting but then it's kind of indefinite because here on Halo 5 it goes up to six hours and you're done uh, on Halo Reach or Halo 4 it's unlimited unlimited time limit so that that I could see is a problem uh, at least with those raids unless unless they want those games to go on indefinitely 
until the objectives are destroyed. So I'm sure someone can do a similar idea, although I think it'd be more difficult to get it accepted. Because here on this game, uh, you can look across the battlefield if we destroyed everything, and you could see the objectives are physically destroyed. You know, they're on fire and stuff. So, I, of course, I didn't like these ones on fire, but uh, right. you get the idea. Yeah. Um, and one of the bigger questions, I suppose, that I've had on my mind about this since I've heard about it, and it's one that has passed through the community before, but on a different scale, I suppose. Um, recently, and I guess recently is kind of a bad word considering it's to an extent still going on and has been going for a while. Uh, people have kind of been, I guess in a way, segregating or kind of splitting the community based on the games. My personal opinion is we all play Halo. We're all part of the same community, even if we can't play it together. However, people have kind of been splitting the community from Halo 5, Master Chief Collection, Reach 4, are you military, are you UNSC? And uh, with this new way of combat coming in, people are definitely going to roll into this. I can see it already, you know, personal opinion again. So that would actually split the community into two different types of combat, per se. Would you see that as a problem? Or is that not really a problem at all? Is that simply just a different style of role play you could see people getting into? Well, it's definitely not going to be an immediate shift uh, if there is a shift. Um, the way I see it, there will, always, there will always be those clans that continue to do the traditional raid. Um, some clans just can't stray away from it. Um, and you can't expect everyone to get on board with this. So what I'm saying is that those traditional raids are going to occur alongside these types of raids. Um, not everyone is going to get on board with this, and a lot of people might, a lot of people might not. So honestly, I don't know. Um, I don't see it being a big problem with different raid types. Some clans, okay, some clans might claim that a raid isn't valid unless it's a traditional raid. Okay, well, those people are just being stubborn. Uh, when people decide to stop being stubborn and move on and try to do something more productive that is more helpful not only to them but to the community as well, um, I feel it will be very beneficial. Um, However, I mean, I can see some opposition coming along to this idea. Uh, you'll have people who have been sticklers for ROE meetings and trying to uh, have <laughs> community-wide rules opposing this because this has no extensive ROE that defines. So not everything is clearly defined, which some may see as a problem. I say it's more of an honor code. Whether or not you abide by it is up to you, and I can't make everyone follow it. And no one can make everyone follow anything. So the way I see it, if people are going to do their own thing, uh, I'd rather have them do their own thing in this manner. So there's at least something to go off of. And that something is the destructible objectives and the progressive type map. All right. And uh, speaking of ROE Strickler, um, and this, I guess, is referencing to a person that's just a part of the question here. Uh, in the past, and I mean multitudes of past, uh, as, far in, as far back as Halo Reach, as far as I can tell, there have been people who have been trying to standardize the way combat is done. I believe you've even mentioned that in our tour yourself. Um, that they try to change combat, in my personal opinion, in a way that personally benefits their clan. Not exactly a bad thing, considering they're putting their clan first, but it's obviously looked down upon by a lot of people and usually turns out for the worst. Uh, back on Reach, people were doing it saying raids are invalid. They call themselves military clans, but would do uh, competitive 4v4s and the like. And back on Halo 4, uh, I believe it was Power made a series of YouTube videos uh, saying that he we should make raids more objective-based, uh, more or less with assault or flag. You know, not that they're bad ideas, but obviously it didn't catch on real well. Uh, how is this different than those ways of attempting to standardize raids and standardizing pretty much the way combat is done in our community? Well, in... Uh... The simplest terms, this is a hybrid. It's different because it's different. <laughs> it's not It's not the same. It's not a team. It has, still has the free-for-all aspect to it. So a lot of the, um, most of the clan community operates raids on free-for-all. So they're going to like that aspect of it. And it has objectives that can be destroyed and are permanently gone once destroyed. 
and that means something to the people playing the game. When you make something have value, you give something value, then it has value. All it takes is a little bit of role play. You just have to say this, this decides this, and this decides that, and that's it. I mean, it's a hybrid because it's got the free-for-all aspect and the objective aspect, and it doesn't have, like I said, it doesn't have the team aspect, the team-based, until you get further on. But the standard most most common raid you will see will be this type of raid, at least for the Commonwealth. Um, and like I said, it's different because it's different. <laughs> it's not the same as anything that's been done before. Um, with the scripting and the layout of the map and the uh, this one code, this one rule instead of many rules and the map being designed to naturally limit the unenjoyable factors that occur in battles, um, I, I really don't see any other way to characterize it. It's honestly its own thing. That's an interesting way to put it, and it's good. I mean, raids are fun, and I'm sure this will be just as fun once you get it up and going and people start doing it. I'm sure they'll see just how fun it is. I personally think I would love it myself, honestly. Um, But on that line, you know, being unique is great. Being unique can be really good, at the same time can be really bad. At the same time, you're not trying to be unique. What it sounds like is you're trying to innovate on something that is pre-existing, which isn't bad either. If you can improve something, by all means, improve it. Um, Would you say, I mean, kind of a stupid question considering you're doing this in the first place, but would you consider this an overall improvement to our traditional raid style that we've been doing since a questionable amount of time? I would say definitely yes, because it institutes more military-style play and communication and teamwork uh, in the team. Uh, It also encourages um, people to do raids again, because a lot of times, or oftentimes we see now that we spend hours and hours training our soldiers for military-style combat, claiming to be military-based clans, and we find ourselves uh, approaching long coverless bridges with snipers and ridiculous amounts of (laughs) fortifications on the other end and people call that a raid and that is not a raid that is that is a slaughter that is what that is that's nothing it's it's silly that we would waste our time training for something that's absolutely pointless yes and i believe that this gives more merit and value to combat itself um if people can do this and enjoy it, which they certainly will, um, because it'll have a more realistic feel to it, and also more of a role-play aspect. It not only will encourage uh, more enjoyable combat, but um, more enjoyable clans. Um, So better military base, the older, traditional, more serious military-based values, so taking the game more seriously, you know, because in-game assets have real value, rather than uh, there might be a fort on the map, and everyone's just kind of killing each other and fighting to take the base. <laughs> so, and some people have their own rules. Everyone's got their own rules and such. There's really just one rule to this, and that is, the if the attackers destroy the objectives, then the defenders lose. If the defenders hold out for the time limit, the defenders win. Um, of course, there's more unspoken rules. Like if you're going to build your own map, you need to obviously design it in this fashion so this sort of layout that's really the only way to keep it to its uh, original design to keep it functioning because like I said some people won't do that some people will abuse the idea and they'll say they have objectives on the map that are destructible it's the same thing that Shadow Sniper 172 said yada yada no it's not if you add all these other weapons on it and you add all these other vehicles and you make it so that the spawn is smack in front of the first objective or whatever and the defending team is right there that's that's a spawn kill that's overpowering the map that's that's doing all the things that's breaking that I'm against that's breaking the concept so you're working hard to create yes so it essentially depends upon the clan being honorable uh, or at least the defenders who make the map being honorable and I understand that people aren't entirely reliable and they're going to do their <laughs> own thing but um at least it's a step in the right direction. 
All right. Um, and with that being said, earlier you did point out something specific, and I didn't say anything then, but I can ask now, of course. Uh, you mentioned spies being very effective, or at least being more effective in this form of combat because it can turn a, a defender into a sudden attacker. Uh, would you say that might bring back the reliability and use of spy organizations, uh, much like what we had back on Halo Reach? Well, I would say yes, because you can physically harm the infrastructure of a clan. If the clan is taking these maps seriously, um, then they would consider any time they play on this map, for training purposes or whatever, a raidable game. In fact, we plan on leaving our uh, games on friends friends open, so anyone can add a friend in the Commonwealth and try to attack our our area maps. So, in fact, our clan at least is organized in this manner. The first training session of the day for each platoon, during its uh, plan for training of the day, is to go on an area map and conduct practical hands-on type training. So exercises and the like. We won't be destroying our own objectives because that'll be harming our own map. <laughs> if anyone joins a game and if anyone joins a game any enemies it suddenly becomes a raid so if you have a spy in our clan um and that spy takes out the armory destroys the generator in the base uh and starts just destroying objectives and then the enemy joins the game cuz a spy invited them that is considered that should be considered a raid that should be considered sabotage and it should be taken seriously and this will force clans to take the game more seriously. They'll leave a sentry on the base. They'll leave. They'll have people ready to react at any time. And I feel that it adds a lot more realism to it instead of, hey, can I have a raid with you this weekend at 8 o'clock? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's not how it used to be, and that's not how I think it should be. I think that it should be more, you should be able to, you should be able to have that element of surprise, or you should be able to declare war on a clan and, you know, the war be taken seriously. Right. So, yes, this answers your question. I know I r ranted a little bit there. Honestly, uh, the more detail you give, useful. the better. The more detail you give, the better it is. So I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna question you and, at uh, all, man. <laughs> and I mean, uh, this goes with the realm of assassinations as well. I know assassinations are a separate thing than raids, but for the Commonwealth, at least, assassinations matter. So, for example, I have not been assassinated on this game yet. So, normally I'd have a guard with me, but. You're the exception. I'm trusting you. Oh, well, don't worry. I don't plan on putting a knife in your back until you piss me off, and I don't think that'll be happening anytime soon, buddy. <laughs> You're definitely a good person well, so far. You. you you have not uh, you have not so rustled far. my jimmies, as they guess they say. Um, do you have any questions? Any comments you would like to say about this uh, as we wrap this video up? Uh, anything you'd like to say? Um, yes. Um, in terms to getting your own area map started. I understand people are going to steal my maps. I'm a good forger. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is a very good them. map. This is a so good map. People are people are going to take it no matter what I do, and I accept that. So I take that as a compliment. However, um, I highly encourage you build your own map so that the terrain is new and interesting and people can you know, experience different types of gameplay and everyone has a shot at making their own map. And I know Forge is a little more difficult on Halo 5, and it is challenging, and scripting is a little complicated, but um, eventually we'll put out on the Commonwealth Media channel, and that is Commonwealth Media, I suggest you look at it, subscribe. Um, eventually there will be a scripting tutorial for destructible assets um, to help our viewers and help people in the community build their own maps like this, um, but I will tell you, it does take a long time to build these maps in relative detail, like you see before you. It took, it takes about, on average, 8 to 20 hours to build a good map like this. So, that's the only real deterrent, other than, you know, people who are opposed to change. Uh, that's the only other real deterrent I would see coming towards this system. And uh, I encourage you not to be lazy and uh, get started, because... You could spend 20 hours sleeping or <laughs> trying to raid people, trying to get into a raid or or matchmaking or whatever, or you could spend 20 hours building a map like this and have one. <laughs> so and call it now, your own. 
Now, with that being said, I, I did have a question about the uh, basic uh, area map layout that I don't think I covered. Um, well, I know I haven't covered yet, but I don't know if you covered it per se. Um, so, a similar map layout. Um, would there be a, a specific way you would tell them to do, like, the objectives, the destroyable objectives? Because I know if it's not, like, set in stone, some clans may put, like, 30 objectives on a map. As per, I believe you have it, the way you have it set up right now, it's 2, 1, 4, and then 1. You know, you got the two at the the dam, you got the one at the crane, you got four in the swamp, and then the generator in the outpost. Uh, would you say there's a specific way they should be setting it up or have a li little bit freedom but keep it to a fair extent? Like, what would you say on that? Well, the game actually would force you to limit uh, how many objectives you can have because for each scriptable properly scripted destructible objective it takes up two of your channels two of your scripting channels so you know a through z you've only got so many channels so it's going to force you to again do do the way we want it done or the way it should be done um so you're not going to be able to have that many objectives on the map anyway but a good rule of thumb uh, that we suggest at least the way we do it like i said we're setting the example because there's a lot of those where you can pick and say uh, but it's not set in stone here. Like, does the base have to be like this? Does the does there have to be a manis? Does there have to be uh, trees and cover around the base? Whatever. Like I said, we're setting the example for what it should be like. So, that as long as they simply follow the example, um, then it should be fine. But to answer that question, um, yes, there is a recommended amount, and the recommended amount is you want to have at least three other objectives other than the outpost generator if you have an outpost generator or a final objective so like if the final objective is defended somewhat better than the rest of them like for example here we have this base this base isn't entirely isn't very overpowered you know there's cover leading up to it and such um and the enemy has progressed pretty far at that point if they get to the base but there's an objective inside the base so there's at least three other objectives outside the base that are spread out. So the dam, the port, and then the fuel cells spread out throughout the swamp. So we consider that three objectives. Of course, there's like little smaller objectives spread out just to make sure the enemy hits different areas, but that is the recommended amount. All right. All right. Uh, thank you very much for giving me some of your time to do this interview. And with that, gamers... This is Makarov, signing off.